Good evening. Welcome again to our evening service here at Berean Baptist Church. We are thankful and hopeful that many of you have tuned in again tonight through the medium of the internet. One day we'll this will pass and we'll be able to have a crowd, I hope. But nevertheless, we're glad that those of you who do listen in. Before we look into God's Word tonight, I have a couple of announcements I'd like to make. <clears throat> First of all, there may be some listening in. We don't know this. We don't have an uh, idea of all who's listening in, in on the Internet. But you may be new in the area. You may be someone looking for an old-fashioned Bible-believing, uh, King James only, Baptist church. Well, when this Kenora virus is over, I'd like to extend an invitation to you to visit us here at Berean Baptist Church. Get acquainted with us. You might like us. You might not. But be that as it may, we would love to see you. And uh, uh, we're at 17377 Godwin Avenue here in Port Charlotte. You can find it. And we're kind of offbeat, but we're not that hard to find. And then we would, I would like if some of those of you who are listening, drop us a line on the Internet or uh, some way or another. And we'd like to get a sort of a, 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 an idea of how many folk are really listening in. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a bad case of science problem that drives me crazy sometimes, and I apologize for that. But. We'd like to hear from you, and if you could uh, give us a call, uh, drop us a line. I'll give you my email address. I'm not afraid to do that. I get enough stuff, but it's Cowardin, C-O-W-A-R-D-I-N, at Embark, E-M-B-A-R-Q, mail, M-A-I-L, all one word, EmbarkMail.com. I would like to hear from you. If you'd send me an email, tell me who you are. Let me know if you listen to the services. It would be a blessing to us. So that's my commercial for tonight. Also, I mentioned this morning, Brother Phil Croy passed away. Uh, I believe, I thought it was Friday night. It may have been Thursday night. But some of you folk may want to send Sister Pat a card. Here is the address uh, that you might do that. It's 22972, 22972, Maple, M-A-P-L-E, Ridge, R-I-D-G-E, Road, R-O-A-D, North Olmstead. You know how to spell North, I'm sure, but Olmstead is O-L-M-S-T-E-D, Ohio, 44070. I know that it would bless her heart. Uh, it would be a, a comfort to her to hear from some of our people. So if you'd like to drop her a, a card, uh, tell her of your prayers, your concern, and encourage her during these days. That would be a real blessing. All right. Take your Bibles tonight, if you will, and open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read a couple of verses there. He, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. I'm sure you're familiar with these scriptures. I understand as pastor and preaching as long as I have that very seldom do we ever get on a subject that there has not been some preacher preach on it. There's not been someone in the congregation that's not uh, very familiar with it. And then there are those who are not familiar with it. Uh, uh, so we try to do the best we can. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, <clears throat> no, excuse me. I want to begin with verse 24. I glanced down here and <laughs> sometimes I miss the, the, the verse I want. Verse 24. Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. Know ye not? Don't you know, he said, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, talking about the Christian life, but we, an incorruptible. And then he began, he, he turns personal here uh, uh, for a few moments. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or put on the side uh, or disqualified is a, is a Greek translation of that word uh, there on it. Paul said, I, I'm careful in my preaching and my teaching that I'm able to back it up with my life. And that ought to be the desire of every born again Christian. <clears throat> but let's go over to Hebrews here, uh, chapter 12. If maybe some of you are following in the, in the word of God. And Paul follows up with this thought we have here in 1 Corinthians. And he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to notice in this verse, and we're going to go back to uh, 1 Corinthians, where he says here, uh, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily be set us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us. Now, with those words, let's go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 24. I'm sure tonight, <clears throat> positive almost, that most of you who are listening to me, uh, wherever you might be, that most Christians are familiar and understand that the Apostle Paul, in these passages of Scripture that I've just read here, he is using the analogy of a marathon race to that of the Christian life. And in doing so, you find that he makes several comparisons between the runner of a marathon race, those races that, went, that took place back in his day, and he makes a comparison to that, to that of the Christian life that we as Christians are in a spiritual race. And he makes a comparison here uh, on it. You, he, he finds several things. He says they are running to receive a prize. That prize, he says, is a crown. Now, you see, the Christian is not running to win salvation. He's not running to get salvation. He's already on the track. He already is, is qualified to run. What's he running for? He's running that he might receive a reward or a prize, which the Bible says is the crown that Jesus Christ has reserved for them that love him. Then he says they not only are running to receive a prize, but he says they are running at being temperate in all things uh, there. Now this, this simply means the runner has self-control uh, and he's obeying the rules and following the regulations that is set out for him to run the race. Let me say something to you tonight. The Christian race is no different. The spiritual race that we're in is, is actually no difference whatsoever. You see, God has given us certain rules and certain regulations. He's laid out for us certain things that we as God's people are to live by if we are to receive the crown or the reward or the prize that God has for us. Then he mentions something here 
The runner <clears throat> is physically conditioned for the race. That is, he puts off everything that he can that would hinder him from being victorious in that race. Now, that's what Paul is mentioning in that scripture I read over in Hebrews. He says, let us lay aside every weight, everything that might hinder us from running the race and winning the prize. I, I don't know much about marathon races, but I do know this. Those that are running that race, they strip themselves down to the most minimum of clothing. Usually it's shorts and probably shoes. That's about it. They, they do not carry with them anything that would slow them down and would keep them from completing the race on it. But I want you to notice something here in Corinthians. Now, I'll, I'll land here in a little bit. He says here in uh, <clears throat> chapter 9, uh, he says here in uh, verse 26, a strange statement. He says, so fight I. So fight I. Now, what does that mean? If I were to ask you to interpret that statement, what would you say? Well, I'm sure I'd get several answers. But I believe I'm going to give you something God gave me, and I hope, it, I hope you, may, you may already have this. But I hope in some way, if you haven't, it'll enlighten you about running this race. He says, so fight I. Now, listen, he's not talking about, a, I mean, he's talking about a race. But all of a sudden, he, he says, but I, I, so I fight. Now, what's a fight have to do with a marathon race? What in the world does he mean? Well, I believe what he means is simply this. He said, he's referring back that in running this race as a Christian, there is a struggle going on between the flesh and the spirit. I don't know about you, but I fight that fight every day of my life. And Paul is saying here, as I run the spiritual marathon race for my Lord Jesus Christ, I have a struggle con continuously. I have a struggle with, between my body. No, I know it's the flesh because what he says here is, uh, I keep my body. There's a struggle going on. There's a fight going on between the spirit and the flesh. Now, I can prove that if, you, if we turn back to Romans chapter 7. And let me share something with you, just a few verses. Paul identifies the fight that we as Christians have between the spirit and the flesh. He says in Romans 7, verse 13, For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would that I do not, but that I hate, that's what I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. But he says it's no more uh, that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Here's a man, sin dwelling in Paul? He's saved. He's the apostle Paul. He's one of the greatest preachers that ever lived on earth. And yet he's confessing that in his Christian life, he has a spiritual struggle going on continuously between the spirit and the flesh as he runs his Christian spiritual race uh, there. And he goes on to <clears throat> verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But for the evil which I would not, that I do. He says, boy, I've got to fight. I've got to continually work on this thing of being, staying in spiritual shape that I might run my spiritual marathon that I might be able to receive the prize, the crown that 
God has for his people. I'm sure that tonight that many of you have this same spiritual struggle on it uh, there. And so he writes in Hebrews, let us lay aside every weight, everything that might hinder us from running the race to the end, fighting the fight between the flesh and the spirit, and ultimately winning the crown that God has for us. Now, he, Paul makes another notation here I'd like to point out. Go back to Corinthians. He says here another thing. He says, in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection. I want you to notice the word I keep. You see, the race is, uh, he's talking about a physical race, but our spiritual race is a marathon as well uh, on it. And we, I'm running, I'm running this spiritual race in my physical body. I will be running the race until God calls me home or God raptures me up or whatever the case might be. But this race is a spiritual marathon, but I'm running it now. I'm on God's racetrack and I'm running in my physical body, the spiritual marathon that God has set me on. And I'm looking forward to that day that I win the crown that God has for me on it uh, there. But in order to do that, there are some things in this physical body as I run this spiritual marathon, I must keep in order to win the prize. I hope you're getting this. I hope you are on it. You see, he says, I keep under my body. That's physical. The race is spiritual. But we're physically, we're running it. Therefore, if we are to win the prize, there are some things that we who are on the racetrack must keep if we expect to win the crown. I want to quickly share with you tonight some things the Bible says we are to keep. Our body, the physical part of this race, in order to finish it as we want to finish it, there are some things the Bible says we must keep. Folks, there are some things God is not going to do for you. Now, he will equip you and give you a, a way to keep these things, but there are some things at our disposal as we run this race that in order to finish it, to receive the crown, uh, along, the, along the race, we, had be, uh, we have to keep some things. The Bible uses that term, keep. So I want to share with you a few things God's bo a book teaches that as a Christian running the marathon in this physical body, there are some things God expects you and me to keep. Number one, if you turn in your Bibles to, over to the little book of, of James, it's right after Hebrews, you'll find that the Bible says we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Let's just see what God says. James 1, verse 27. He says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. What is it? To visit the fatherless and widows in their aff affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You see, James is that wrote this book and sets forth what I call the, the practical issues of the Christian life uh, there. Uh, there. He, in other words, the practical part of, 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 of religion 
the practical part of being a Christian is that he says it's, it's to minister to others, to be a blessing to others, uh, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Uh, there, we, we need to be a, a blessing and a help to our brothers and sisters who are uh, carrying a burden or who are sick or who uh, have a, a, a problem. That's part of the ministry. That's part of being what God wants us to be. But in doing that, he says that he makes, he throws this in here. In doing that, you, we must keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Now that is our separation. I don't think I have to argue the point that God says that his people are to be separate from the world. I, I believe that. I, I think you'll agree with that. Oh, uh, there uh, on it. <clears throat> and the world. Now, this word world here in James uh, 1, 27 is, a, is the word that is translated from a Greek word that means this world system. This world that we're living in, so to speak. And it includes all of the evil, the ungodliness, the unrighteousness, the wickedness that is associated with this world system uh, there. It refers to all that which is against God, and all that God stands for. May I say to you tonight, whether you know it or not, this world system is anti-God, it's anti-church, it's anti-Christian, it's anti-against everything God stands for. God's people need to wake up to that. <clears throat> you say, well, well preacher, why, why? Why do you say that? I say it on authority of God's word. Why? Because the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. And if that be so, and it is, then Satan hates everything my God stands for. Amen. On it there. Uh, there. And so, what are you saying? I'm saying Satan's behind it all. Amen. Amen. Satan's behind all this. I mentioned this morning in my message, and we listen. We need to come back to uh, understanding of what, what sin is, and Satan's behind all this sexual perversion uh, in the world, the, sla the uh, slaughter and murder of the unborn babies, uh, all of the violence, all of the crime, all of the dope, all of the alcohol. Satan is the god of it all. Whether you believe it or not, I can stand up here and and say without apology, our nation is a cesspool of wickedness tonight. Ah, uh, there. And but but James says, in the midst of all that, we are to keep ourselves unspotted from it. Now. Here's an interesting thing. This word unspotted, what does it mean? Well, it simply means this. It doesn't take very much of this world to defile and contaminate us. For instance, I'll use a couple of illustrations here. You, you'll forgive me if you, if you think they're too crude. But for instance, Just think, an apple or a fruit, they start to deteriorate and they start to get rotten most of the time simply because of one little spot. Amen. I have had fruit in my house. I've set it up on the shelf and for some reason or another never ate it. And after a few days, I look at it and it's beginning to turn putrid, brown, soft, and mushy. 
and I look at it and I see on that apple or whatever or whatever it might be, it started with a little spot. And that spot penetrated that fruit and contaminated it, and eventually it rotted it there in uh, on it. Now, folks, it just takes a little sin to contaminate you. Doesn't have to be something big, gigantic. You know, we think about adultery and uh, murder and lying and cheating and all, all of those atrocious sins, and they are. But many a Christian has been contaminated with just a little spot by the devil. For another illustration, I just thought of this. <laughs> it may not be good, it may not, but getting just a little spot on a new suit, a coat like I've got on here tonight, or a, or a nice pair of pants, whatever it might be. Just getting a little spot on a clean pair of pants or a suit. Now that little, listen to me, that little spot could be here on my shoulder or my arm. Just a spot. But you know what it does? It affects the whole suit. It affects the whole suit. That one little spot makes that suit unattractive and you need to take it to the cleaners. I, I, I've had that happen to me several times uh, on it there. Uh, now, this is what James is talking about. As Christians, we're to keep ourselves unspotted. Don't let the devil... Mess you up. Don't let the devil contaminate you by what you might consider just a little sin. By the way, there is really no such thing as a little sin. Sin is sin. I get tired of this, a white lie. No, there's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie. Amen. A falsehood is a falsehood. Uh, period. On it. But, Satan will, like I said, Satan doesn't, I, I observed this years and years and years. A lot of Christians that have fallen into deep sin, deep sin, it started out with what they would have considered just a tiny sin. And yeah, not so bad, preacher. Everybody's doing it, you know, uh, in this type of thing uh, there on it. But, that little spot, that little sin penetrated and before long the whole garment is contaminated. Oh, listen. As you and I run this spiritual marathon in this physical body, you hear me? As we run this race, we must, we need, it's imperative that we keep ourselves unspotted from this filthy, rotten, wicked, unrighteous world. Amen. Uh, on it there. Why? Because if you don't, you're not going to, I'm not talking about salvation. You're already on the track. You're running. But you won't receive the prize. You won't get the crown God has for you. Now, so number one, we're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Number two, oh, back in 1 Timothy, he named something else that we're to keep. 1 Timothy 5, 22. <clears throat> Here we go. 1 Timothy 5, 22. Listen, now you, you, I want you to get this. We've got to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. But then secondly, the Bible says, we are to keep ourselves pure. P-U-R-E. Listen to the word of God. 1 Timothy 5, 22. Uh, just let me read it. 
uh, there. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man. In other words, don't ordain everybody that comes down the pike. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Don't get involved with the sins of others. And then he makes a blunt statement. Keep, keep thyself pure. Now again, what's he talking about? Well, right here in this verse, he's talking about our personal walk and conduct. He did not say, listen to me. He did not say, keep yourself sinless. You can't do that. But I guarantee you on the authority of God's word, you can keep yourself like what he's talking about here. You can keep yourself pure, pure. Now, what's, what's that mean? It just, it boils down to really one thing. It means keeping yourself morally clean. Morally clean. Living lives that are without reproach. Just a little far back in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Listen, here's how Paul puts it. Living lives that are pure without reproach. And here's what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 22 and 23. This is not a suggestion, church. He says in verse 22, abstain from all appearances of evil. Listen to me. Even if it looks like, even if it hints a little bit by, uh, of being wicked and unrighteous and ungodly and being evil, stay away from it. Abstain from it. But notice verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that word, blameless. Blameless. Oh, listen. Our lives, as we run this marathon, our lives are to be beyond reproach. We are to so live that the world, wicked as it is, sinful as it is, we are to live in this world such a life that they cannot find any fault with us. Not perfect, not sinless, but morally pure. Why? What did Jesus say? He told his disciples, and it, it was to us, ye are the light of of the world and he said let your light then so shine you need to read it it's in matthew let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven our life our walk our conduct ought to be that when the world sees it, it brings honor and glory to Jesus. Amen. So as I run this race physically, this spiritual marathon that I'm on, I am to keep myself pure. Now, I realize maybe, you know, somebody said, you can't do that. Well, if, you, if it's something you can't do, I've got a solution for you. What I can't do, God can. Amen. No, I probably can't keep myself pure as I ought to be. But I tell you one thing, I can work at it and commit it to, to my Savior. And I guarantee you one thing, if you're, if you're walking and living to serve him 
and and walking in his in his light, you're not going to have any problem with what I'm preaching here tonight. You will be able to so live, not perfect, not sinless, that's impossible, but you will be able to live that the world cannot blame you or find fault with your God simply because you live the way you're living. I do not want anyone to go to hell simply because of the way I live. So I'm to keep pure. But lastly and quickly tonight, there's another thing that we're to do. We're to keep ourselves from idols. Oh, little book of 1 John, just right on over uh, just a little bit before you get to Revelation. <laughs> he, he, he concludes his writing, John does, to those Christians. Man, what a book 1 John is. And he concludes it with these words. 1 John 5, verse 21, he says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. <laughs> now, I can hear someone saying right now, exactly where you are. I can hear you say, why, preacher, I don't have any problem there. I don't have any problem with that. You see, I don't bow down to idols. I don't have any graven images in my house. I don't have any little statues out in my yard. I'm not an idol worshiper. Well, that sounds good. But wait a minute. An idol is more than just a graven image or a statue. I'll show you in a minute. In fact, a definition of an idol, it's defined like this. If you get this, you'll understand what idol worship is. The definition of an idol is this. It's an object of passionate devotion. Did you get that? An idol is an object of passionate devotion. Thus, an idol can then become anything that one puts before the worship and the devotion to God. In other words, hear me, an idol is anything that means more to you than Jesus means. It becomes the most important thing in your life. An idol can be anything from money to possessions or even to people. Whatever it might be, if it has your devotion and your allegiance, and, is, and has the top priority in your life, it's an idol. It's an idol. Oh, I may not see it. Your friends may not see it. Your companion may not see it. But it's there. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, the Bible says, flee, run from idolatry. That's what God says on it. You had better be careful tonight, dear friends. You better be careful who or what has your devotion. Jesus said, I didn't say it. I don't, uh, you don't have to answer to me for it. Jesus said, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our being and everything that's within us. And folks, if we do that, then he is number one and everything else is number two.
I would venture to say tonight that some, uh, almost everyone listening, in some place in your life, you've got an idol. And that idol, you may not confess it, you may deny it, you may pretend that it's not real. But that idol means more to you than Jesus. Whatever it is, or whoever it is, you, 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 you're devoted more to that than you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what it is. If it comes before God, it's an idol. And it's no different, hear me now, it's no different than having an idol in your front yard or a graven image in your house. An idol is an idol. And if you have one, you're not going to get the prize at the end of the race. That's right. You're not going to win. You're just not going to win it uh, there. So you better watch out tonight who you worship. Who has top echelon in your life? Who is number one? The answer to that will tell you who your idol is is yep we're running a race it's a spiritual race i understand that and we're running it in this physical body i understand that but in order to finish well and in order to receive the prize paul writes in hebrews we must keep our eyes upon jesus and in doing that, we must do these three things. We must keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Just a spot will do it. We must keep ourselves pure and unblameable. We must keep ourselves from idols that would hinder us. This is something God is not going to do for you. You're on the track. You're in the race. But it's up to you and to me how we run. Do we run keeping our eyes on Jesus? May God help us to do that as a Christian. I uh, I want to finish my race. And that's why David had him title this message, Run the Race. But, to, but run it well. Run it faithfully. Run it toward the prize of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, somebody says, well, I don't really care. I, 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 if I die, I, I just get to go to heaven. That's all I care about. Well, according to the Bible, that's really not so. Because if you don't run the race successfully enough to get the prize, you're going to lose some rewards. You're going to lose them. I, I don't know. I don't know everything about that. I've studied it. I read it. I, I believe it. But you're going to lose some rewards, and you're going. You're. You're. It's going to affect you. You go to heaven. Oh yeah. You'll go there. But you may go there empty-handed. You may not re receive any crowns that God has for His people. I think the worst thing about not getting a crown is simply this. The Bible says there's only one thing. We're not getting the crowns for our glory. What's a crown going to do you any good in heaven? It's not going to do you any good in heaven. 
except for one reason. We get our crowns that we might take them and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And if you go and end the race empty-handed, you will not have anything to lay at the feet of Jesus. To me, that 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 enough that alone enough. Oh, I'll be he in heaven, but I will miss the privilege of laying my crowns at the foot of Jesus. So I encourage you tonight. I encourage my church, my people, run the race. Run it hard. Lay aside every weight that would stop you from getting to, uh, to the finish line. Keep your eyes on Jesus the whole time. And one day, receive the crown, the prize, the reward that God has for his people. Let's pray. Father, tonight, it's been good to be in God's house. I pray tonight, Lord, that you will bless the message. I pray, God, that you'll speak to hearts through it, my heart, uh, by preaching it with all my heart. I want to see our people. I want to see them running the race with their eyes upon Jesus. I want to see them running the race unspotted from the world. I want to see them in that race, giving it everything that they've got. Oh, God, I pray for I pray for me. I want to run that race. Paul had a warning. I didn't get into it. But he, he says he ran it because he ran it faithfully because he did not want to be disqualified. Oh, God. I don't want to be disqualified. That just simply means unworthy. He just, just not up to the race. Unqual he just sort of put on the sideline. I don't want to be put on the sideline. I want to be in the fight to the finish. I want to come down to the end of the race. And there be waiting me a crown a prize from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray for my people. I pray for our church, Lord. I pray, God, for our nation. I pray for our president. I pray, God, that by the grace of your hand, you'll put your hand upon this virus and we'll begin to see a decline in the sickness and the deaths. Lord, I know it's in your hands, but I'm asking, please, if it be thy will, bring this thing to an end. In the meantime, help us to be faithful. Help us to run the race, fight the fight, keep the faith. Please, God, help us to do that. Help our church, help my people to be faithful. Help them, Lord, to... Do what, uh, uh, what they ought to do, though they can't be here personally. But Lord, help them to do what they ought to do as Christians. Watch over them, protect them, and keep them. Until next time, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Amen.